Now, uh, group purchasing organizations have been exempt uh, from the anti-kickback uh, statute of the Social Security Act. How does the, the special legal status of GPOs make it difficult for entrepreneurs to compete for business from hospitals? And uh, I will ask uh, Mr. McLeod or Dr. Rubin if you have any comments regarding the same question. Thank you. It has distorted the purchasing process. Mm -hmm. Any company that has kickbacks in its decision making is going to miss on choosing the best product at the best price. This is why anti-kickback laws were there and this is why they are especially needed in healthcare. So by carving this out, by introducing a third factor, which is how much commission is a third party going to make on the way of that decision. And if that commission is based on the volume or, or the size of the contract, then you can see the distortions that can come in. The example I gave in my, in my introductory comment was $20 million or $10 million, 5% on one or the other can distort some opinions and some decisions. Mm -hmm. And in so doing, if we go back to the large manufacturers, the large suppliers, they usually have the higher market share. They usually have the wider product offering. So if we're here to see how that impacts entrepreneurs and their companies, there is no doubt that they will be crowded out. They have been crowded out and they continue to be. Uh, Mr. McLeod? Yes, I, I think the, uh, the antitrust concern is potentially related, but it is, of course, different as well. Under the antitrust laws, if a particular healthcare organization, whether it is a hospital or some other entity, uh, chooses to buy one device or one drug over another drug, even if it's a bad decision or a mistake, there is not much the antitrust laws have to say about that. What raises concerns about GPOs, of course, is that large numbers potentially reaching a significant share of a market would make the same mistake and we have seen many reports of that kind of decision thereby preventing the ability of a new manufacturer of a device or a company offering a new therapy or a new drug or a new service mm -hmm. to be foreclosed from an entire market. I actually represented a physician in a case in which it wasn't a GPO, but it was the same kind of situation where the physician believed that there was a combination among the hospitals and the physicians in an entire area that prevented him from providing his radiology services it becomes a serious antitrust problem when the market begins to close down to someone who has a better mousetrap to offer, with apologies to the marvelous devices and uh, other services that the healthcare industry provides. So do you think there are the basis for uh, FTC to look into it? Oh, I would think that if there is a free road for the FTC to look into this area that the commission, both from the commissioners down to the staff, would be delighted to do so. Of course, I don't speak for them, but I could tell you when I was there, I would have loved to have had my hands on this. <laughs> Dr. Lerman? Uh, I, I don't think I have that much to add to what Mr. McLeod said, mm -hmm. other than that when the government is involved in large uh, purchasing decisions, uh, we don't need a competition agency necessarily to make, uh, to consider competition issues. Uh, I think that's the point that the AAI report makes, that uh, competition is a, is a it, it, it's, it's an American policy, and it deserves to be considered in, in, uh, by, by everyone. Uh, Mr. McLeod, I, I understand that you have experience in uh, international antitrust policies. Um, I would like to get your perspective regarding which anti, uh, antitrust uh, regulatory regimes around the world do you think are the most effective in keeping markets open to entrepreneurs and what can we learn from them? I think the most effective one is still right here in the United States, Madam Chairwoman, and I think that it has done a remarkable service around the world. As Chairman Kovacic testified, he himself has been one of the ambassadors of the United States in explaining antitrust laws to emerging economies as well as to uh, uh, more mature market economies. 
and that the provisions that we have under the Sherman Act, the Federal Trade Commission Act, and our other antitrust laws mm -hmm. are the same sorts of provisions that other countries can uh, adopt very beneficially for their own market economies. Sure. Can I comment on this from the trenches, please? Okay. All right. Uh, three years ago, venture capital went on notice, put us all on notice. They're no longer going to invest in entrepreneurial startup companies. Sure. If they can no longer get these companies to the marketplace. So yes, we are the bastion of free markets. We are the bastions of entrepreneurship. But let's not bruise something that is really working for this nation. We lead the world in medical device and in innovation. But we are stifling it. Okay. <clears throat> Dr. Hazel, you know, we are in the midst of a presidential election. And uh, health care is uh, one area where both candidates are offering their vision uh, to uh, reform uh, health care. But a, a particular area is IT. And uh, everyone talks about how IT have the great potential to improve the quality of care for patients as well as reduce cost. However, the adoption of health IT requires a degree of cooperation among the provider community. Are FTC policies discouraging physicians from getting together to cooperate on health IT? Um, uh, yes, ma'am. And, and the answer to your question is, I believe, yes. Um, How is that? Okay. <clears throat> Clearly, uh, we think that health information technology has a lot of promise. As mentioned earlier, is a tool for looking at outcomes, uh, improving efficiencies, and so forth. The issues that we face, um, I, I both um, have been president of a practice that has 35 physicians in Northern Virginia and also chair a regional health information organization in Northern Virginia. And uh, so I'm one of the believers. The issue is, is really one of, let them finish. Okay, okay. I'm sorry. The, 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 the issue is one of, um, of partly expense, um, and it is uh, the, the savings that accrue from the things that we're trying to do and are trying to promote. For instance, in your, in your Medicare budget, you uh, have a three-year payment of 2% for e-prescribing in an effort to reduce medical errors. Um, it, you have to have systems that work to do that. You have to have it on the physician side and on the, the pharmacy side and so forth. So, so the point being is, is they take um, some investment they have to be maintained, updated, operated, and the savings accrue to payers. And in the case of Medicare, theoretically, it's to the to the um, to the government. And in what we don't have is an equivalent. You were kind enough to put a two percent kick in the Medicare payments for e-prescribing for three years. We don't have a similar thing in the private sector side. So as we use some of the savings to afford the technology, we have to be able to work with payers to do that. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question? Yes. Yes. Um, Mr. Shabat, do you have any other questions? No, Madam Chair.